Thank you so much. It's so great to be here. So I wanted to start my talk today with a single word, wireless fidelity. Well, I guess that's two words, but maybe we can get away with it if we use the abbreviation Wi-Fi. I'm sure we all love Wi-Fi, right? Yeah? Wi-Fi is great. And yeah, we, it's so commonplace nowadays, and we're becoming increasingly dependent on it even to the extent that we can't get a drink at a water fountain unless it has Wi-Fi. <laughs> but let's get real for a second, though. I am very fortunate to have grown up with this abundance of Wi-Fi around me. We had Wi-Fi at home, there was Wi-Fi out in the public. I had so much knowledge at the tips of my fingers, only a Google search away, at any place and any time. But then, when I was in grade nine, an even more revolutionary thing happened. They were finally bringing Wi-Fi into our schools, and I was ecstatic. I could read all the e-books I've ever wanted. My favorite, of course, being Facebook. <laughs> and I really couldn't be happier. That was until that fateful day, I decided to pick up a newspaper instead of scrolling through my newsfeed. I came across this article talking about the negative effects of bringing Wi-Fi into our schools. Particularly, it focused on the health risks associated with being exposed to Wi-Fi radiation. This article said Wi-Fi was carcinogenic. Now, I didn't know what that word meant at the time, so I turned to trusty Google. And it turns out, it means it could cause cancer. So this article was telling me that something useful, beneficial, and outright wonderful, like Wi-Fi, could be bad for me, not to mention it could cause cancer. I refused to believe it. I started reading up on this a bit more, and I came across a few scientific studies. In one of them, they exposed mice to Wi-Fi radiation. And guess what? Yeah, these mice develop tumors. Now, in hindsight, I suppose that should have been enough evidence for me, but it wasn't. I was a very curious and skeptical child, so I refused to believe it. And that was when I turned to science. I designed an experiment that would allow me to measure the effects of Wi-Fi radiation on cell growth. Now, my goal had initially been to do this experiment in an actual research lab, with all the machines I would ever need. But you can imagine a 14-year-old girl walking up to a lab manager saying, hi there, I have this experiment I'd really like to do. Could I come work in your lab? <laughs> it sounds absurd, right? And I guess to some extent it was, because they turned me away. They told me I was too young. So I did the next best thing. I ransacked my high school science classroom. <laughs> With permission, of course. And I borrowed a couple of materials. I got some beakers, I got a microscope, and a spectrophotometer. Now, that's a word I couldn't say at the time, but essentially, a spectrophotometer is a small device that allows you to measure the concentration of something by using light. So at this point, I had all of my equipment good to go, but I needed a location. I headed down to my basement, and I went full-on Dexter's lab style to build a small functional lab that would allow me to carry out this experiment. Now, I know what you're all thinking, so I'm going to insert a small disclaimer in here. Of course, all of this was executed with parental supervision and guidance in a safe and controlled manner. <laughs> Very much unlike Dexter's lab, so <laughs> just putting that out there. OK, so great. My lab was good to go, but I needed cells. That's when I went with my mom to the grocery store, and I bought baker's yeast. I grew these cells in a mixture of sugar and water, and I subjected half of them to Wi-Fi radiation, and I shielded half of them from it. And these are the results that I got. Now, I know these images are a bit blurry, but that's because they're the first images of living cells I've ever taken in my life. Uh, I'd like to think I've gotten better at it, so hopefully that's true. 
I remember having to position my digital camera over the lens of the microscope ever so carefully. And when it matched up perfectly, I clicked as fast as I could, because that moment usually didn't last very long. Nonetheless, here they are. So the image on the right shows cells that were shielded from Wi-Fi radiation. And you can see that, for the most part, these cells are round and healthy, like you'd expect yeast cells to be. But when you look at the cells that were exposed to Wi-Fi radiation, there's definitely something going on here. It's almost like they had a growth spurt, and they started growing uncontrollably. Because they didn't have space in the beaker, they began clumping together. And it's like they were forming tiny tumors inside this beaker. Lo and behold, I guess, to some extent, Wi-Fi radiation does accelerate cell growth. And maybe way down the line, at a really high dose, it may lead to cancer. The moment that I got these results, it's a feeling I can't really describe with words. I was torn because part of me was in dismay. The article had some level of truth to it, I guess. But part of me was happy. I got results. My experiment worked. But there was also something else there. It felt like I went on a treasure hunt, and the treasure chest at the end held new knowledge, for lack of better comparison. I felt enlightened, and I realized that I had a passion for science and engineering. This experience helped me develop an intuition for it, and it inspired me to pursue a career in STEAM. Now, STEAM is an acronym that stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, Arts, and Mathematics. The demand for STEAM is really high right now, in all sectors, whether it be transportation, healthcare, product development, you name it. Pretty much everything we use on a day-to-day -day basis can be related to STEAM in one way or another. But don't get me wrong, we've come really far. We've made many amazing discoveries, and we've created revolutionary technologies. But there's still a lot of uncharted territory out there left for us to explore. And if we want to explore it, we need to prepare the next wave of STEAM professionals to tackle these unknown challenges, to solve problems that we don't even know exist. And one way to do that is by exposing students to STEAM in the real world. We need to get them to where all the action happens, in industry and academic labs, in companies. Now, this is something I really wanted to experience for myself. I wanted to work in a lab so badly. But all of my friends around me were telling me I was growing up too fast. You're still a teenager. You have loads of time to work in a lab, like when you're 21 years old. Spoiler alert, I am doing that right now at MIT. <laughs> But hearing all of this just made me even more adamant. I vowed that I would get into a lab. Not to mention that with each passing day, my interest and passion for cancer research continued to grow. I distinctly remember this one instant when I was participating in the Run for the Cure, organized by the Canadian Breast Cancer Foundation. And at this event, I had the opportunity to chat with a cancer patient. I told her about this Wi-Fi cancer project that I'd worked on and how I wanted to become a cancer researcher when I grew up. She was delighted, but it was the next thing she told me that really stunned me. She told me that she was willing to volunteer as a human subject for any studies I had planned in the future when I became a cancer researcher. And that statement really made me emotional because I realized how desperate she was for this disease to end, and she was willing to put herself in an unknown situation to make that happen. So I wasn't about to give up. I kept trying, and I knew that my drive was well-placed. I sent out probably hundreds of emails to researchers and institutions asking if I could work in their lab. Some of them still got back to me saying I was too young. Others told me their lab was full, and most of the time, I didn't even get a response. But then one day, two years later, when I was 16 years old, I had a shiny new unread email in my inbox. And it was from a professor asking to schedule a meeting with me to go over some research projects that I could work on. 
Now that's what I'd call a foot in the door. One thing led to another, and eventually, he invited me to work in his lab. Now, <laughs> I know this is going to sound cliche, but the moment I set foot in that lab, I knew I was where I needed to be. I distinctly remember the first time I took a lab tour. My mom had driven me to the lab, and she was with me on the tour. And the professor was telling me about the lab and people in the lab. And after the tour, she asked me, did you even understand a word he said? Your jaw was unhinged the entire time. And it's true. I was in awe at the amount of insane technology around me. They had a machine for pretty much any experiment I could ever imagine. They even had this one machine, which was like an automated DVD player, except for samples, and it would automatically take in your samples and in a matter of seconds spew out the results. Like, that was crazy, it blew my mind. And as I started working in the lab, I realized how different it was doing experiments in a lab setting compared to doing it in a classroom setting. For one, I was taught how to be safe in this environment. I was taught how to explore science in this controlled setting. I was surrounded by graduate students and postdocs who taught me new terms and skills. And sometimes I'd use this jargon with my family when I wanted to make a point, because they wouldn't understand what I was saying, but I really knew, like, I knew what I was talking about. So that worked out pretty well once in a while. Not to mention that they got me thinking about the scientific theories behind the machines we use and the techniques we employ. And this is something that some of my friends in the third year of their undergraduate degree hadn't even been exposed to. In terms of professional development, this was a really great stepping stone for me to find other research positions at institutions across the world. Again, some of my colleagues who didn't have this prior real-world experience found it difficult to secure internships, and it's just getting more competitive out there. In terms of academic development, I found that the course material I learned in my high school science classes stayed in my head a lot better when I was able to associate it with the real-world example from the lab. And I realized the reason this was happening is because I was employing multisensory learning. Now, multisensory learning is the idea that we learn with all of our senses, actively. When I was in the lab, I was employing visual learning, auditory learning, tactile learning. And this allowed me to turn on all of my senses so I could activate multiple learning centers in my brain. And what this allowed me to do is it helped me store and recall information more effectively and efficiently. Well, this is great. Why aren't we sending more students out into the real world so they can employ multisensory learning? And that's when I started thinking about Canada's education system. I was recently looking at the top 20 education systems worldwide, and this is the ranking from 2018. Unfortunately, Canada didn't make the cut. But there is one country that's consistently topped these rankings and is currently at second place. And that country is Finland. So what does Finland do differently? Well, one thing is the widespread use of what's called a vocational school. These vocational schools are designed to send students out into the real world so they can pursue internships and interact with professionals. Almost 50% of the students in Finland attend these schools, and here, they learn transferable skills. Now, these skills allow them to develop critical and analytical thinking so they can solve problems in any field of study. Not to mention, they're employing loads of multisensory learning. Now, Canada has vocational schools, too. But I think the key word here is widespread. We need to make more students aware that these real-world opportunities are out there if they want to pursue them. We need to encourage them to pursue their passion and to take on new challenges. At least for me, I know that by pursuing hands-on learning in the real world, my perception of STEAM has definitely changed a great deal. For one, I learned the importance of collaboration. Very rarely, pretty much never, will there be a single scientist working on their own to suddenly discover the cure for cancer. No, it just doesn't work that way. As a biomedical engineer in training, we're taught concepts in mathematics, in medicine, computer engineering, and even structural design, 
so that we can bridge these fields together and interact with specialists in these areas to ultimately create new useful technologies. Innovation is, of course, the result of collaboration. I used to think that STEAM was just an acronym that stood for five distinct fields. But now I realize that it's a lot more interdisciplinary. STEAM is a way for us to use science, art, and mathematics to ultimately engineer and build new technologies. But the thing is, students shouldn't have to build their own labs to get this real-world experience and develop this mindset. We need to bring more students to where the action happens. In companies, encourage them to pursue internships in labs. And by doing this, we can demystify STEAM for the next generation of researchers and innovators. We can help them develop successful and innovative thinking, no matter how young they are. Because after all, age is just another piece of data when it comes to research and innovation. Thank you.